I want to talk today about structural and temporal information and how might this be related to the wonderful work that you guys are doing in your brain center. So let me start. So the first I will tell you a little bit about the center and what information is. So we bet so we understand this. And then I give you two examples. One will be how we can infer, uh, uh, let's say, evolution of brain, as one example, from, uh, con con from connection of different functional parts of the brain. And then how much minimum, how much information we need to actually compress uh, uh, structural information in the brain. So this is a plan. So let's start a little bit about information. As you all know, in 1948, Shannon gave us two beautiful solutions to data compression, data transmission. That's how information theory started. But nowadays, information is not about transmission and compression. It is uh, secure, it is uh, analyzed, it is valued it is process and so on and in order to understand flow information in uh, in biology in uh, brain we need something more general that's why 10 years ago we started the center when we basically try to understand a quantitative understanding of representation communication processing of information biological brain is here physical and other stuff now we focus on fourth important aspect of information that we pretty much ignored before, structural, temporal, spatial, and semantics. On, in a dynamic environment, when situation environment changes, think about evolution that changed them. Think about Facebook that uh, you have uh, a lot of changes, people are coming in and on, and try to understand the flow of information. So that is basically the idea. And now uh, let me tell you how I view, among other brain, brain research. For me, it's physics. So there's this inductive science. So you collect data first. And from the data, you are trying to build some model of the brain. And you are using this model to pre predict some future behavior. And then you use data to confirm this future behavior or not, whether your model is good or not. But there is one part missing for me at least. So in the, at least in the center, and I convinced some of my colleagues, we have a triad in data science. From data, I want to go first to information and then knowledge. Now let me try to define and explain few of the three aspects. Data, I think everybody understands what it is. Knowledge, nobody understands. It's too complicated, it's too philosophical. So I'm gonna make it very simple. I will say that knowledge is information and action. So everything comes down to information. What is information? Something that you can explain to your undergraduate students. And it's not entropy actually. I will claim, and the next few slides, I will try to convince you that information is a measure of distinguishability. For Shannon, it was distinguish, see, distinguishability between signal and noise. But in data science, the situation is a little more complicated because basically what noise is in data science is a lot of other data that obstruct extracting useful information. I will come back to this. So the idea is to frame the foundation. And once you have the full, good foundation, you can actually do also good practical work. Let me insert here Shannon again. Shannon gave us this three beautiful theorem, but what is most important, at least in my view, he gave us a, a spirit of work, of a, 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 a roadmap, how to work. He say first, ask the fundamental question, find the limit in case of Shannon, he asked two questions. What is, the, what, the, what is the best compression I can do? What is the limit of compression I can do? And second question, how much information I can transmit in a noisy channel such that still I can recover with high probability of information. 
this question, this fundamental question, we have somehow to bring here to brain science. So uh, I will show you some possible questions that we might have. And then there is a second part. Once you have the fundamental limit, you want to go and to more practical algorithmic aspects and find solutions that achieve this fundamental limit. But if you go in these two phases, what is important is you know what the best you can get and you can't expect anything better. So in case of compression, what do you compress to entropy? Yeah, basically that's it. Not that simple, but this is how we can view it. Let's go back and try to understand what is information. Uh, there is a beautiful article 1935 by Carl Fontaker. It's still, you can find it on the internet. Uh, he was trying to tell us what information is. And I summarize in three sentences, I try to explain them to you. He said that information is only that which produces information. You can basically interpret it that context, uh, objective of the recipient, all of this matters how you actually interpret information. He says something more, which is important. Information is not absolute. What does it mean? If I ask you how much information is on these slides, I think I can get three different correct answers. Some of you will do statistic of every letter on this slide and give me something, entropy or whatever you prefer. Other people will go will look at words and do statistic of words. This will give you a different number. And another group can look at the shape of the words or letters. So in each of these cases, you will give me some measure of information, but it's not absolute. Finally, he also say information is only that which is understood. And I think Richard Feynman explained it very well. He said information is as much as a property of your knowledge as anything in the message. So to explain this, if you expect if you expect a letter, uh, whether you get an award or admission to a college or not, the whole letter might be very long, but the first uh, two words tells you everything. I'm regret or I please, you know the rest. So if you have a prior knowledge or site information. Now we are more in, in biology and physics and Paul North in 2008 wrote a beautiful article in Nature when he was saying that biology, including brain science there, and should be, is at the center, at the crossroad, and needs to bring information in order to understand flow information, to better understand spatial and temporal order in cells. I believe this also applies to brain sciences. And it would be great, actually, if you guys at the end of the year or now write something, what you learn actually, to, I don't know, to some well-established journal that people can see how you view how important mathematics and physics are in actually understanding behavior of the brain. Now, one aspect of Paul Nars that we will discuss today is what Frederick Brook did in 2003 in a three-page article in JCM. I think the title was Three Great Challenges of Computer Science, and he said the the biggest challenge is to extend Shannon information to structure. How much information in the structure? Structure of brain, structure of graph, structure of organization chart, and so on and so on. Just one more thing. I just finished reading a book by Antonio Tallinger, who just got Nobel Prize. He's a quantum scientist. He did teleportation. And he has even more interesting view on information. Once we bring quantum, all of what we say is just upside down. He basically say that the reality and information are two sides, two sides of a coin, uh, and they actually interact. I don't have much time to discuss it, but information can impact reality, and reality can inf impact information. So let's try to settle what what information is. We know that we have to include the relativity rationality, time, spatial context. And if you want to go very philosophical, you can say that a piece of data carries information. If it can 
impact a recipient ability to achieve the objective of some activity within a given context. Very complicated definition. We're going to ignore it. Uh, 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 I want to give you something that every physicist and engineer understands. And I claim that information is a measure of distinguishability, as I mentioned before. If I cannot distinguish, there is no information. So we have to first, of course, it is a very loaded definition because we need to uh, define distinguishability on different situations. Distinguishability might mean many different things. Now, if you want to argue with me about this, this definition, let me bring you big guns. Charles Bennett, before even we come up with the definition, actually, in 2006, I think, he wrote the following. So information is really a very useful abstraction. It is the notion of distinguishability abstracted away from what we are distinguishing and the carrying of information. So distinguishability is the key. And of course, the question is, if you want to apply it to, let's say, brain research, biology, um, network, you have to understand, you have to define this more properly. Let me bring another guy, big guy, uh, Kolmogorov, who says that information theory must precede probability theory. These two things are not the same. And he was basically saying, by very essence of the discipline, the foundation of information theory has a finite combinatorial character. So here it is. The reason that it is confusing because there are different uh, aspects of information in general audience. So, for philosophers, it's knowledge and logic, and we're going to leave it alone. We are in the information B, where we count the distinctions, which it usually means finite combinatorics, even without uh, probability. And there is also called more of complexity. I would like only to add one thing that logic turns out to be very important for actually information B, because logic can restrict. Uh, the number of possibilities. And because of this, I would say logic, computation, information are four, three aspects that are very important actually to put them together. Okay, I think I'm almost done two more things. So we, in, in, in um, understanding and um, brain, let's say, and studying it, we go from data and we have a lot of data and we tried at the end to learn something, to build a model, let's say. But we have to go through the information part of it. And I already mentioned this. I call it information efficient computation because these are two phases of it. The first, you ask, what are the fundamental levels? In this case, you can ask, what are uh, the, how much learnable information in the data? There is noise there. You cannot learn everything. You can learn something. What is the best that you can learn? And you have, of course, have a criteria for it, but, and I will show you two or three of them. Once you have this answer, then you can find, try to build algorithms that actually extract this information up to uh, the, the limit. That's what we call information efficient computation. And I will show you a few aspects. We wrote an article about this, a little bit philosophical. I will show you some of two examples of this point of view for graph compression and for extracting temporal information from a dynamic graph. So now we are going to a more technical part. Uh, after this philosophical thing, we need to bring something interesting to mathematicians. So here, what I will do, I will focus on dynamic networks. Here's one, over evolution, brain evolved. I'm looking at a functional connection, con connectome. Some, uh, some part of the brain must work together with the other in order to accomplish the attack. When I walk, I have to breathe, but I don't need to think or uh, write a letter or anything else. So there are some part of the network must work together in, in order to accomplish function. Uh, so this network 
has a special structure. I will come back to this because that will be my main application. But there are more. There is protein-protein interaction network. Different protein interacted. This both of this network dynamic. Certain aspects, certain part of the brain are very old. Other are new. Some maybe disappear. The same with proteins. There are all proteins. Some proteins we don't see anymore right now. So these are the snapshot of evolution that we see right now. So the question that I would like to ask for brain of a protein from this snapshot and knowing that it is dynamic network, can I do inverse engineering and try to answer the question, which part of this network of this network are the oldest, which are the newest? So I want somehow recover arrival of different parts functional part of the brain of protein. This is not easy because this is a very old network over millions of years built, but Facebook is probably easier. Internet is probably easier because we can actually generate a lot of data. So that's what I will, will discuss. And I will focus basically on brain, a little bit on protein-protein interaction network. And I will ask this question and try to formulate it more mathematically, but let me do more motivation. We have a cartoon that we did in 2018-19, which is very uh, on time now. And this is saying the following. In a small town, a virus arrived, infected the whole, uh, uh, the whole small town. People are going to the hospital, and people in the hospital are trying to connect who infected whom. But people are not going the order of infection. So you see some kind of a connection between different parts of infection. And what you would like to discover is in which order the infection spread out, for example, from knowing only this structure. So more example of this sort. Uh, spam spreading rumor in, on internet. You are seeing something at this time, but you don't know how it was initiated. Uh, spread of infection disease, I just show you financial transaction, money laundering. You see, uh, 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 you see first dynamic graph and on, on, on the top of this, a, a dynamic process spreading rumors. Uh, protein, protein interaction. Actually, it is important to learn which proteins are oldest, because as I understand, they might actually be related to some kind of a cancer. And here's an example that I'm going to use. Uh, so let's assume that we have data of fMRI of a healthy brain. And then somehow I try to connect. So I identify, let's say, 50 different functional parts. I connect them based on whether they are work together, they are correlated, and build a graph. I show you how we do it. And from this graph, I'm assuming that is a dynamic graph generating by, by some dynamic model, and I will discuss it day two. And so these nodes are arriving and some are being deleted. That is a snapshot that I want to see. It. From this structure, can I recover how this graph was generated? Can I say that this part of the brain is older than this part of the brain? This will be the example that we'll be using, but I think the whole model is important. So the first thing in order to put this question into a mathematical framework that we can handle, we need a good model. And here is mathematical formulation of the model that we want to do. So we will have N nodes, node one, is the oldest what not n is the youngest i always use it and here is by the way one way of generating dynamic node every node that arrives connect to three existing nodes but this connection is not arbitrary these nodes the new node when arrive try to connect to nodes uh, more likely to node with higher degree than not. So it's proportional, connection is proportional to degree of an existing node. Here is the node, dynamic node, and this is the snapshot that I see now, except that I don't know actually that this, that this is the first node, this is the last node. 
I just, what I see is basically, I see the structure, but I don't know, I arbitrarily label these nodes. And that's what I have. I have a structure which is exactly the same as the original and some random permutation of the nodes. What is my task? My task is to find an inverse permutation from this to this one. And the question is, and this is a fundamental question, can I do it? Can I actually do inverse permutation based on the structure? It's not an easy question because no, notice I have n nodes and for every pair, and I have n square pair basically, I have to decide, let's say for pairs three, eight, whether three is older than eight or not. So I have to guess correctly n square over two pairs and to put some order between them. This is not an easy task. And, but at least we have a formulation. So again, I have a graph generated by some model. In this case, preferential attachment model. I have a random permutation of labels and I want to uh, recover the, the inverse permutation. So there are different, of course, it's all of this depends how the graph is generated. The simplest is erdos renier which is not very dynamic. It's basically, I have n nodes, I choose a pair, and with probability p, I put an edge, and y minus p, I don't put an edge. Preferential attachment is this which we will deal with, and I will argue, at least for our experiment, that this is a model of possible model of uh, uh, of generation of a brain and here how it start i start with one node at time t a new node arrives and there is parameter m i fix it but it can be random and it connects to m nodes but probability of connection depends on the degree of the existing node so it's the, it prefers degree nodes with higher degree there is another model that is more likely to be good for protein-protein interaction network. I mention this because what we can define and prove preferential attachment doesn't work that easy for duplication networks. It is good to have it. So how it works. So this is a duplication divergent model. I start with some initial graph, a new node arrive, and it selects uniformly one of the existing nodes, in this case, node E. Then node E has neighbors C, D, and F, and my new node arrives to them, and then with probability one minus P, delete some of these nodes. So this is the first phase. Second phase, for all other nodes, it connects to them with very small probability that depends on how many existing nodes you have. Let's say probability R over N. So you see it connected to this one. Now I have another node and choose this I. I doesn't have, it's isolated, no neighbors. So two doesn't connect to anything, but in the second part, it can connect with small probability. In this case, one over, I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One over 10 to existing node. And for example, in this case, it connects to this two. Node three, the same. So this is how it works. Okay. So there are two parameters, P and R and N. N is the total number of the final nodes. At, the, at some point, let's say at time three, the nodes choose uniformly one of the existing nodes. So if I, at time t, I have t nodes, I choose every node with probability one over t. And then <laughs> I look at the neighbors of this node and connect to all neighbors. And then there are two steps, a and b. Once I connect to neighbors with probability one minus p, I delete some of the connection, but that's not at the end. Uh, after that, uh, with, at, uh, let's say it's time n, with probability r over n, I connect to other nodes. Let me, let me, okay, let me do it. A new node arrives, four. Node four arrives, it selects uniformly among all of this node, one of the nodes, which is one. 
This was the node that arrived, by the way, at time one. Node one has neighbors this, this, so four connects to all of these neighbors. And then this part A and B happen. It deletes out of nodes, but that's not at the end. And it edits extra notation to all of these good nodes that were not selected in part A. So here the problem. Uh, uh, we would like to answer some of the questions. For example, one question will be, uh, if I have a graph, the randomly generated graph, dynamic graph, how many bits do I need to describe it? Another problem more interesting is, once I have a snapshot of a graph, can I actually discover the order of the arrival of the nodes from its structure? In order to answer this question, I need to understand a little better properties of the graph. One of the most important property is symmetry. Let's look at this graph. I put labels. I keep the same structure. I can permute these labels on five factorial way. So I have 120 different permutations of labels that have the same structure. But that's not the answer. If I want to look at the distinct label graph when I permute, notice that if I permute B and C and D and E, I'm getting exactly the same label graph, the same adjacency matrix. So the number of distinct permutation of the same structure, in this case, is 120 divided by two. Two is the size of the automorphism. So what is automorphism? It's a mapping graph into itself that preserves vertex connectivity. And in this case, automorphism consists of two identity and the one that I showed you, B and C, D and E. But that's not all. I told you in this case that every permutation, five factorial, is good. But it might happen that the model, generation model, does not allow for certain permutation. Let's consider the following preferential attachment. And now I'm going to permute two and four. So in this graph, original graph, by preferential attachment, I always add three edges. And the last, <laughs> the last node must have three edges. If I permute four and two, this four, which is supposed to be the last graph, have right now five edges. This permutation, two and four, are not allowed. So the number of allowed admissible permutation is not n factorial, it is smaller. So the model generation might restrict the number of permutation. Having all of this, the number of admissible graphs, what it is, it's all permutations that are allowable, and I want to find distinguishable uh, uh, permutation. So it's number of allowable permutation divided by symmetric. This is the number of distinct permutations that give me the same structure. There is one more property here. Every uh, permutation, admissible permutation, have the same probability in generating it. it. It's not true, by the way, in some other models. So knowing this, here's the question. For a graph generated by preferential attachment, can I do with high probability from a snapshot of the graph, recover the order in which the graph was generated. It turns out that it is too complicated task. Remember, I have to guess probably n square over two n choose two pairs, and for every pair, say this node arrived before this one. We actually every algorithm that we can think of cannot answer this question. With probability one, it's making a mistake because it makes around n square mistakes and we have to guess n square. So this is a fundamental question that does not give us a good answer. We have to, but at least we know where we are. We have to probably change a little bit formulation to get a reasonable answer and I'm gonna do it but before we do it, we have to learn a little bit more about graph generation. So what I'm gonna do first, 
I'm trying to answer a different question. I want to know, uh, I have, you see, label graphs and it's unlabeled structure. And the question that I'm asking, how many bits do I need to describe label structure and unlabel? Now, you won't be surprised that in both cases, I, the lower bound channel already gave us is the entropy of label entropy, which I denote entropy of graph G. G is always label, so this one. And this is entropy of a structure, unlabeled graph. They are relation, but not always. I'm in, I will consider only the case that if I permute these labels having the same structure, every permutation have the same probability. It doesn't happen for duplication divergent network. So I call it invariant under isomorphism. If this is the case, the relationship between the graph entropy and structure is through these two parameters, automorphism and G. Why? It's not difficult to see, look, entropy of a graph is the same entropy of a graph, joint entropy of a graph and structure because all the structures in the graph. If I have a joint entropy G and S, I can write the entropy of S minus entropy, conditional entropy of S, G under S, but since every permutation is equally likely, this probability is one over this set, which I remind you is this one. Now, if it is equally likely, this conditional probability is log of the cardinality, so log of this, which is here. What is conclusion? That there are relations of between graph entropy, number of bits to describe this one, and number of bits to describe this one, through these two parameters, through the uh, number of uh, uh, permutations that are allowable and automorphic. Let me illustrate it on one exact quickly. Erdos-Renier is relatively simple, but that's how we start to looking at this. So we have Erdos-Renier, and we can compute relatively simple uh, Erdos-Renier uh, uh, structural compression. First of all, the first parameter here, anxious to HP, is the entropy of uh, label graph. Why? In Erdos Renew, you have a matrix n by n, and I put randomly with priority p1 in each, co co in each position. So I have n choose two position, each with probability p, I put one. So the entropy is n choose two HP. But the automorph, if you remember, is n factorial divided by automorph. We can prove. Not us, somebody else proved that the red or is asymmetric, so out of all of this is basically one. So you have all n factorial. This is, by the way, the structural entropy. This is the first question. How much, how many bits do I need to describe the structure of the graph? Now I need to have an algorithm that actually matches at least the first two terms because I know it's optimal. We have such algorithm. I just briefly show you because I want to go to more interesting problems. I call it structural Z. You see this algorithm, which by the way, how it works briefly. On this example, if this is my graph, labels are added only so I can explain to you. This is a description of the structure, concatenation of these two strings, how I created this string. And this is basically to analyze, and I'm not going to spend time on this, but basically I choose one node, I, and I store the number of neighbors, say one, two, three, four. Zero, one, zero, zero is four. It is the number of neighbors. I delete this I node, and then choose one of the neighbor F and do the same. I divide in lab, uh, neighbors of non-neighbors, and store the number of them. Once I do it, by the way, at some point, the node will have only one neighbors. I store it here. These are these boxes, doesn't matter. This algorithm, we can prove, matches the first two terms of the entropy. So this is the, this is the idea. First, answer the fundamental question, find what is the lower bound, and then find algorithm that achieves this lower bound. Now let's me do something more interesting. 
let's go to preferential attachment graph that I already described to you. And every arriving node uh, uh, establishes M connection. M might be, uh, I will use deterministic, but in general, it might be not. And the question is how much symmetry such a graph has? How many bits to describe it? And the most interesting, which I will not address today, is how do I know that such a graph is actually generated by preferential attachment graph? I will at the end mention that this is a very interesting question, an open question. Okay. So the first question that we need to answer is symmetry, because we know for structural compression, we have to know how much symmetry. I show you the number of automorphisms here for m equal one a lot as a number of nodes. It's basically growth linear. For m equal four, there is no automorphism. So what we actually can show that for m equal one, which is basically not a graph but a tree, it has a lot of cherries like this, of so a lot of symmetry because if I flip this and this, I see the same graph. For m equal two. There are structures like this that are hanging on from the graph, and they have some symmetry, but only with small positive probability. We spend a lot of time to prove that for m greater than three, and this is an example, the graph is asymmetric. Then automorphism is the, the probability that automorphism is more than identity is very small probability. So there is no automorphism. Moreover, we use this to estimate, you remember this gamma, the number of permutations that are allowable by the graph generation. So uh, in, it, it cannot be greater than n factorial. So log of this should be n log n something. We can prove that the expected value actually is n log n, almost like n factorial, but the second term is n log n, n log log n. So now we have everything. We know that for m greater than three, no symmetry, and we know gamma. Okay, so what I want to show you right now, uh, before, before we do it, we need to find answer this fundamental question. What, is the, what are the entropy? So the graph, label graph entropy from preferential attachment has this formula. This part is very easy to explain. Look, there are n nodes. Every new node connects to m uh, existing nodes. Every existing node links log n bit to describe. So the total number of bits is n times m times log n. That part is much harder to get, and I'm not going to explain. What is interesting, we can prove using the formula that I show you relationship between level entropy and structural entropy that related to symmetry and gamma, that is compression of the, uh, of the structure is M minus one, here's M, M minus one log N, and this goes like N log log N. So here's the question. Can you give me now an algorithm for structural compression of preferential attachment graph with fixed M that achieves this lower bound? And I will show you one. Okay, so here's an example. This is the graph that I want to compress. The first thing what I will do, and there is an algorithm called peeling algorithm that I later show you for uh, this temporal order problem, that basically tells me how it was generated. It basically says that this node connected to this three, this node connected here, here, and here. I can recover this DAC the direct life cycle graph from the from this graph by a special argot peeling algorithm that is important for other problem and I show you how to do it. So let's assume I have this. Here what I will do. I will do DFS, depth first search. So from this node, I'm going through this edge to two. I'm going through this edge to three, but I get stuck. So I have to backtrack. I'm storing the blue number as a backtrack. I have to go back, and then I can go to four. No backtracking. Five, six, seven. I got stuck. I cannot go anywhere. So I have to backtrack two, six, five. Then I can go to X, backtrack, and so on. 
So you see, every node has two numbers, the red number, DFS, that for search, and blue number, which is backtracking them. Okay, so if I have this, how are you gonna compress? Okay, first, I will compress optimally the blue number. So what I do, I do empirical distribution of black numbers. There are seven out of 12. Like tech, I'm sorry, I, I guess I missed the definition of a backtrack number. So backtrack, so you see here, when I go from two to three, there is no edge that, because I'm going backward that you see, there is no edge that I can go to the next node. So what I have to do, I have to go back one to two in order to go to four. From four, I can go to five, six, seven, but from here, I cannot go here. I cannot go here. So in order to proceed, I have to go back one, I have to go back two, and here I can go to eight. So the back number here is But two. now, how do you retrieve the info, this two? So uh, where is this, stored, uh, this information? I, because the algorithm, DFS algorithm give me automatically these numbers. So ah, computer okay. science know it, okay? okay. My okay. Mo more interesting question is, okay, these numbers are random for a random graph. How, ma how many bits do I need to actually store these blue numbers? And this is an interesting question, actually, and not easy. I will tell you later in a second, but how we do it? We first compute empirical distribution of B. So there's seven, a backtracking number zero, three number one, one, two, so this is empirical distribution. I use Hoffman code of arithmetic encoding for this distribution to cut the number of bits and number of bits is basically log of this probability distribution. How much it will cost? Wait a second. I want to show you, I'm assuming that I have the best description of this. Now I show you how the algorithm works. So you see from num, num one, I go to node two by this edge, but once I'm here, uh, there are two other edges, so n minus one edges that I have to describe it. So I need log n times one and two. So in this case, what do I need? When I go to node two, I came from this edge, so I'm ignoring it. I have two other edges, each of them pointing to one. So I have to store binary number pointing out to the preceding nodes, it is one and one, and there is no here backtracking numbers or nothing. Let's go into the next one. I go to three. Okay, I came from here, but this has a connection to two and to four. So I see, I described two and four binary, and it has a backtracking number. I have to store a code coming from here for this backtracking number. Then I do another one, another one, and so on. So what do I store? This is my description of this graph. By DFS number, M minus one binary numbers showing me which, what are the destinations, like the here, plus backtracking number. How much it will cost me? So let's, let's look here. I have to store destination two and four in binary. So it'd be in general log n, n is 12 here. Plus I have to store, find an algorithm for the back backtracking number. So how much is total? I have n nodes. Every node has log n bits. And for every step of the algorithm, I have to point out to m minus one because I'm not pointing out to the one that I came in. Plus, I have to store the back back backtrack numbers. We know that the best you can do is entropy of the backtracking number, but we upper bound it by the height of this duck. What is the longest path in this duck? And this is not easy part, but we can prove that the longest path in this duck is log n. Then what do I need? Lock, lock n coming from backtracking numbers, and I recover here exactly the same 
uh, part, leading part at the end structural entropy. So, so this algorithm is asymptotically optimal. May I ask a question? Good, go ahead. So, uh, let's suppose that the M, uh, it's a function of N. Say okay. it's a fraction of N. This case, in this case, you have N square with a constant in front times log N. But if you have to encode the adjacent matrix, you need the N square divided by two. So you have the same order of magnitude. So, uh, so interesting thing here. Okay, we go back. It's this one. You see, in the in the Erdos-Renier, indeed, you have to record the whole structure and choose two and square the whole matrix, but not in preferential attachment. It is n log n. It's not n square. Because in this case, the way it is generated, this matrix is very degenerate. That is important. So in Erdos Reni, yes, but not in this structure. So guys, you remember what we did? We wanted from this random, randomly generating preferential attachment graph, when we get a snapshot like this with labels mixed out, we wanted to recover from this structure the order of node arrivals. I already told you that this is impossible, but maybe we can change a little bit the problem. So instead of guessing every pair, I'm going to put some subset of pairs in a bins. And here what I will say. I don't know whether one is arriving before two or not, but I know that these two nodes arrive between four and three. And this arrived before five and so on. So now I'm grouping nodes. And instead of saying for every pair, I say the group, this group of nodes arrived before this one, before this one, before this one, before this one. This is already some information. It's actually partial order. Now. Let me explain uh, what we're really interested. In. So let's assume this is my original graph. I permuted it. This is my permutation. And I will ask only the following question. I want to know whether four in this graph, not this, arrived before one and one before two. By notice, I don't ask anything about node three. Is this part, how good is this partial order? How good is the algorithm that returns to me this partial order? Now, four indeed arrived before three because three is before four. But four and two is not good, and one and two is not good. One and two is not good because you see here on the original graph. So out of three possible pairing, four, one, four, two, one, two, only four, one is the correct. So I would say that the precision of this partial order, if algorithm returns to me, is 1 over 3, 33%. Furthermore, this partial order ignores 3. So the total number of pairs in this graph is 4 choose 2, which is 6. But I only have considered three parts in this partial order. So I would say the density of this is three over six. So these are the gen this is the definition. The precision is the number of correctly guessed pair out of the pairs that I want to consider in my partial order. Density is, okay, how many pairs I will consider my partial order compared to all orders. And these two parameters, forget about recall, precision and density is what I want to understand. And again, what is, this, what is the problem in Shannon spirit? First, I have to understand what is the relation between precision and density for general graph. Once I have this limit, and I know what is the fundamental relation between these two, I can try to build an algorithm that somehow achieves this limit, but I cannot bid it, but I want to be as close as possible to it. So this is a little harder problem, but okay, so what do we want? We want to maximize precision for 
a density as big as possible, yes? Because we would like, ultimately, we would like to have this number of beans equal to n, but we can't have it. We already proved it, it won't work. So every bean will have a some portion of n. The density, remember, the density is the number of pairs that I consider to all pairs. I want it to be bounded below. Now, so let's formulate it properly. So I introduce a notation XUV, which is equal one. When my algorithm five tells me that you arise before V, the precision maximization is what? I want the P, this probability, this probability PUV is probability that indeed in a graph H, you really arrive before V and this is that my algorithm return it. So if my algorithm, if this is one, I want to know, is it true really in the original graph that you arrived before V? And this is nothing else but what I didn't know, K, the number of pairs that my partial order considered. But of course, this XU has some properties. The most important is this one. This is basically density must be greater than epsilon. So the number of pairs that my partial order considered at least epsilon of all plus some others. I'm going to ignore it because time is running out. The problem is how to compute this probability. This is probability that you really arise before V in the original graph for a given graph. It turns out we can, we can compute it some other way, but the problem is difficult. Because in order to compute this probability, it is basically related to linear extension of partial order, the algorithms, and to the power nine, complicated. In order to solve this problem, we use actually Markov chain algorithms to estimate this probability. This is nonlinear optimization, integer optimization, but we can reduce to linear. A lot of computational power to get this curve. The, the, red curve, this is the best you can do, precision versus density. Any algorithm cannot beat this one. So let me, let me go a little quicker. So I will show you now algorithm, and we don't have a proof completely, but experimental plus some mathematics to prove that actually we can do well. How this algorithm works? It is a peeling algorithm. This is the graph. By the way, I label them with this one, but it can be labeled anyone. First, I look for all nodes that have the lowest degree, equals three in this case, number six, 12, 11, 10. From this graph, doesn't matter how you label it. I delete six, 12, 11, and 10 from this graph. And then I'm looking for nodes in the new graph that have the lowest degree, that would be nine, eight, and seven. I delete this node, and then I'm looking for the nodes of the lower degree five. I delete it, then I three, three, four, two, twelve. 12. The claim is these are the oldest, these are the youngest. Okay, now, that is the algorithm how we want to work. What we can prove? Uh, we can prove, and I show you later, that when there is a descendant ancestor relation, so six and two are connected in this node, uh, 12, nine, and four are connected. I know that if 12 is connected to four, I know that four will be older than 12, for sure. We call it perfect match but I can't tell you anything between six and seven. This algorithm, we cannot prove it. So what we can prove, first of all, the algorithm works very well here. This is the optimal curve. What we can prove? We can prove that we have a direct path in this appealing, uh, this structure that I show you, then you, V really lies before you. The problem is, that the number of such a perfect path we can prove are between n log n and small n n square. We really would like to have n square. What we cannot prove, but we know experimentally, that the number of this connected is about n one plus something, not up to n square, but like 1.5. So a large portion 
of this, we have actually theoretical proof that is younger than nine, this is younger than four, this is younger than one, for sure. I can't tell you about 12 and six. I can't tell you between, uh, let's say, 10 and uh, oh, six and seven. I can tell you this, but so we have partial results and actually it works quite well experimentally. So this is for, for uh, simulation. We generate, by the way, this M, the number of nodes added might be fixed or might be random. Still, we have pretty good relationship between density and, uh, uh, and uh, precision. This is for uh, real world, but the most interesting is here and that I'm gonna finish. I have a few more slides if you ask, but otherwise we'll be done. Okay, so we got uh, results from fMRI of a healthy brain. Somebody helped us to create 46 nodes and using Pearson coefficient, we connected two nodes they are correlated, as I told you, when you walk, you have to breathe, and we create a, a graph. It is a, it is a dynamic graph, how evolution basically gave it to us. Then we apply our pure algorithm, and here what we got. This, according to our algorithm, these are the oldest part, these are the youngest. And we know biologists will tell us that corpus callosum is probably the oldest part. This is probably the youngest part. So this is what the algorithm gave us. And the hardest question is, how do we know it? We don't know the grand truth and the verification is the hardest part. So we did one more thing. We got 300 or 400 uh, fMRI of healthy brain and we decided to do the following. We will choose one functional relation, for example, uh, auditory cortex. We apply 400 times our algorithm and we see whether our algorithm return most of the time the same ranking. So when this graph is very peaked, it means that our algorithm consistently tell us this is very old part. He is not that good, but he is pretty good, he is pretty good. So we have some verification, but not, this could be used as a kind of a filter to basically get the first approximation and then we can go further. I think my time is running up. So only quickly, duplication divergent network are interesting because he says a lot of symmetry. You see this blue part is telling me symmetry. We know it that biological network have a lot of symmetry unlike preferential attachment graph. Then building, asking the same question, we don't know about optimal compression because we cannot still characterize this symmetry. We know something. We can apply peeling algorithm and some other version for this preferential attachment graph. By the way, this is mostly experimental graph. And this dot is what some kind of peeling algorithm based on degree and so on gives us. It is far from good or finished. We are working on this. I just have my formal postdoc for three months trying to actually um, understand the symmetry with its small progress. Let me finish with some conclusion. The most interesting question that we don't know how to answer it. If I'm getting data, let's say from fMRI, and I know there is some graph behind it, I would like to now, based on this data, can I decide with some good probability what model generating this data, preferential attachment, Erdos-Renyi, or duplication divergence? I don't know. We have some results about this. This is, by the way, hypothesis testing on a graph or hypothesis testing on a non-homogeneous, complicated, multi-dimension Markov. This is interesting. Very little is done. What we did a little bit is to infer a spatial temporal orders, and I show you something for some graphs, but not for the others. Minimum bits, compression, we are, we, we are pretty good, but number five is the most interesting. If we agree that what we are doing is kind of a fitting experimental science, we want to build a good model, and you guys are doing a fantastic job, 
And based on this model, you want to predict how it behaves and then try to use data to verify whether our model is good or not. The same with Newton then, <clears throat> Einstein improved it and so on and so on. So that's what I think mathematics is good part of actually trying to understand better what's going on. This is my colleague with whom I work, uh, Anand Grama, my former postdoc, uh, three of them. Thank you very much. I hope it was not too long. So we have a graph. Let me, me let us think about a graph that represents uh, a net of neurons. So you have this structure, and you know you want to know how it got wired, the order it got wired. How so is what? How it got wired. By wire, do you mean all, all the edges have been con uh, put? Uh, the, the order that you to put your, your edges in the graph. With synapse and post synapse, how the synapse have been put? That's what you mean? Yes. So I don't understand so, this, uh, but Antonio. So uh, what it is, uh, what kind of this post, and uh, so what, what in graph property, what that means? Well, I, I I didn't understand exactly. Uh, Paulo is speaking about a, a, net, a neuronal network, and then he want to know if you can identify the way the 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 edges have been added to the neurons. Uh, assume that the neurons are the nodes. Is that that is that yes. what you ask? Yes. So I want uh, I I have a question that I do not want to know the order. Uh, of the vertices, uh, and but it's it, we have we have just the structure, and this is a hard problem. So maybe if we can have another graph that represents the activity and the interaction between the, the neurons, wow. uh, we can somehow think of some clusters of neurons, or uh, in order to infer. Uh, regions get, that are getting connected uh, in, in a specific order. I, I think I understand. Actually, it's a very good question. So, uh, yes, you want some extra information from activity or something that can help us to understand better some structural property. Uh, it, here's another, by the way, problem. Of, I think the same order as you. And, uh, the graphs, as I understand, including brain, the protein, and so on, are not generated by uniform model. It could be that there's a mixture of different models, Erdos-Renyi sometimes, then preferential testament, then duplication. So these graphs are not generated by one model, but a mixture of many models, and you want some kind of splitting it would say, these nodes are generated by what model? And it could be some process which we are talking that can help us identify it. And some other nodes are generated by a different model. So you, you want to de declassify these models based on extra information. I don't know much about this, but I think there are some work being done. I think under the name of demerging or declassification, something like this. I don't know much about it, but I think it'd be good to look at it. If if you know how to solve it, just let me know. May I say some things in this direction? So it turns out that probably the most famous class of models used to describe cortical columns uh, is a model by Potians and Dismond, yes. which is a stochastic block block model, uh, in which you have eight communities. Uh, take into account uh, if uh, a neuron is a node and it can be it excitatory or inhibitory and uh, so this gives you two and they can be in four of four four levels four four uh, slides yes. and so, so, block model, four, yeah. so uh, they, they have been using the, the, um, the stochastic block model to describe this so the question in, in this term would be is the stochastic block model the most, uh, the best model in some sense? Best, I would, I would say, in the sense of our friend reasoning, so which maximizes uh, good, goodness of fit and minimizes the quantity of degrees of freedom, I guess. 
This is actually a very good question. We didn't think about block model. I think uh, Emmanuel Abe is doing a lot of work of that. He's asking a little different question, but compression could be asked absolutely in this model. Uh, we didn't look at this. Maybe you maybe you can find somebody who actually can look at this. I, I, and especially if you are saying this is a good model for some of the brain uh, actions or studies. Uh, I, okay, so long time ago, we did something which we defined and we didn't know that this is called a block model. We defined it because we needed it for some other uh, 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 analysis of protein-protein uh, network. I have a feeling that this is possible. And so first you have to understand what is the entropy and find an algorithm that achieves it. I, I don't know of any work, but I think it might be actually interesting. There is a recent work by two young researchers uh, uh, from Neuromat, which was ah. just published at the IEEE. I don't know which of the collections. is a work by the lead of the group is Florencia Leonardi, uh, who is a very good, right. good researcher. And they, they prove rigorously that for stochastic block models, the Klitschewsk Trofimov uh, criterion uh -huh. uh, succeeds uh, identify retrieving the number of communities. Uh, great. So there, are, I know there are some other work of retrieving uh, community, but this is great. Please send me a link yes, if you can. I send Thank it, you. it to you. I'm, I'm uh, uh, probably Florence. Are you going to present this in our workshop? And uh, well, okay. So, but it's interesting because this is a model uh, Disman and Portia proposed. Uh, well, because it was kind. Of, I, I guess many people has had discovered the stochastic block model. Sure. I guess that's a case of Marcus and Portia. But sure. it would be interesting to see if there is some a better model. So I, I was surprised because I was thinking something you or our, our friend uh, Jean Marie said. If I remember correctly, he said that the learning is to be able to compress. That what? Learning. Uh, yes. Is equivalent to, to be able to compress. I think it's learning is equivalent to compression side information. That's what we are doing right now, actually. Okay. So, and I was surprised to, by the fact that uh, usually, usually uh, in a, in German's point of view, you should uh, start with a class of models. And then to put the question, what is the the best model? Best uh, in the sense yes. that it fits well and is, and I you agree. do it. You you assume the model, and then uh, yes, so that actually this is, it's a little bit of uh, reason and you know uh, uh, shortest whatever uh, an, an NML model where when you also want to recover the model and the compression. But I think what we know right now in learning, so uh, uh, I would say theoretical background are very similar. So we are looking at regret or redundancy in source coding and in the, let's say, online learning. They are very similar, except that you have the side information, this feature that actually this feature could be used to learn more about the model. And actually, when the future, you know more future, you can adjust with the model. Yes, I agree. I We didn't go that far. We understand a little bit of mathematics, but this would be actually interesting. I agree with you. You want you you don't want to actually start with the model of generation and, and answer the question. You want to start with data. And yes. somehow from data, the model should be learned. Yes. Well, uh, of course, you you need to have a class of models available. Otherwise, you... yes. Okay, let me ask you two other questions. Uh, so uh, we have a a, a a database named NES with clinical data, uh, and mostly you have data from people with brachial plexus avulsion. Mm -hmm. So these are clinical data of several types uh, and also, uh, well, okay, several types. And a question 
we, we, we have when you, you build a database, as you know better than me, is that you need to put labels to, to classify some. And mm -hmm. the tendency when you start is to put uh, labels to every kind of small detail. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after, when you start analyzing, you realize that uh, many labels are useless because uh, they, they are redundant, there is a redundancy. So the, the question I'd like to ask you is the following. Uh, the question of finding the right number of the right set of labels is a classical model selection problem. Uh, how, how many steps back in, in time you need to predict the future, how many clusters you have is a classical. In your project, which is a kind of, uh, uh, it's like ours, you have biologists, mathematicians, did you did did it arrive to you to discuss the question of how to classify a database? Beautiful question, Antonio. Uh, so there is a work, not exactly this, but that's what I think need to be done by David Aldous. And then we did a little bit. So here what we did, and here what I can rephrase a little bit. Yes. So the question is, when you have a graph, you have structure and labels. How much labels can actually help you whether, for example, can I compress separately both of them? In other mm -hmm. words, labels do not tell me much information about structure and vice versa. So we did a, a model, a tree model, which is a simpler, that uh, the label of the lower level depends on the mark of way of the higher level. So we, we did a local dependency between labels. And David Aldous and somebody else, uh, they, they asked the question, okay, if I have a local dependency between labels, he asked about entropy, because if you know entropy, you tell me how much these labels actually impact a description. And I think, I think your problem could be answered if you actually understand how much local property of the labels tells you uh, it, you, you, I, whether they are completely independent or they are dependent, once you know it, you will know which levels actually play a role, which not. But uh, the, so I would start with the properly defined entropy and connection between levels and structure. That's how, what I would do. Thank you. So, could you please send me the uh, out of yes, uh, I will paper send. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 so maybe someone has a question. Because I have another question. So, uh, so let me ask the question in a more easy uh, framework, which is social networks. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess this question is important also for, for uh, neurobiological data. So in social networks, say like the networks which appear in the United States during the, uh, the, the, two, pre, the two last uh, presidential elections, and, and in Brazil also, uh, so you have two 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 well classified group of sensibilities, mm -hmm. and building uh, actively uh, social networks with informations. So the question is, can you identify the political tendency or the way it appeared just by look at the structure of the social network? And, and I guess in the United States, people claim that. Uh, uh, Trumpian networks uh, are very much uh, are of a, like a star. You have some centers mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. diffuse information. Uh, and on the contrary, uh, left-wing democratic people have a, a, a network in which every board connects with almost every board. So there is a huge discussion. So the question is, if you look at the graph, it could be the graph uh, uh, proposed by Potians and Diesman. Yeah. Uh, or the graph of that. Can you extract uh, an information about the function? Again, beautiful question. By the way, I think your question is related to topology, and there are works actually. So here's the question I have a data, and I try to use from this data to see some topology. So uh, whether this data lays on some structure sphere or some uh, epsilon or something like this. And what the structure tells me on, there are two connected things. 
yes, I don't do this work, but I know a lot of interesting work being done. And uh, so you want to know on which manifold day when the, the data shows you that it lies on a, some manifold, what kind of information it tells me? I think this is actually very important and very good question. I, I, didn't, I didn't do much, but this is a great question. Could you tell me uh, application of the knowledge, the temporality of the brain parts, like uh, the, the, the importance to use like in medicine, I don't know. So are you asking me why it is important to learn about evolution of the brain? Because yeah, that... yeah, application to this. Uh, I think Antonio probably can give you a better answer to this one. Uh, I, uh, so in protein protein network, I can answer it because my colleague Anand Grama, who is actually a counselor, tells me that there are results showing that uh, if you identified all proteins in the evolution, these proteins might be correlated to some kind of cancer. But in brain, I don't know. May I, may I comment on this? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, there is a lot of work on uh, the generation of cells during development and the migration of these cells and a lot of uh, interesting points on uh, trying to understand how these uh, several uh, sets of neurons are organized in the brain during ontogeny for instance and the same holds for the questions on uh, the evolution of the brain uh, trying to consider which are the newest brain regions that appeared for instance in humans as uh, that could explain uh, many of our uh, abilities that differ mm -hmm. from other mammals, for instance. So there, there is a lot of application and it's a very, very beautiful work, Wojtek. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much, Claudia.